It's Sunday morning on CBS. And here again is Jane Pauley. And that's a classic from one of the legends of rock and roll. He's Roger Daltrey of The Who. And Jim Axelrod has paid him a visit. Ever since I was a young boy, I played the silver ball. From Soho down to Brighton, I must have played them all. But I ain't seen nothing like him in any amusement hall. That damn dumb black kid sure plays a mean pinball. Consider the sweep of Roger Daltrey's career. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame frontman for The Who, one of the most influential groups ever. Golden Globe nominated film actor, fashion icon when London was mod and swinging. Whoever first coined he's a rock star as shorthand for boldface success could easily have had Daltrey in mind. How long did it take you to get used to this grand scale fame? It's been a half a about, century now. About 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> now pushing 75, Roger Daltrey is at the point where he's considering not just his career, but his life. And for the first time, he's looking back on it with a memoir called Thanks A Lot, Mr. Kibblewhite, a title that nods to the source of his ambition, his school principal who threw him out at the age of 15 for misbehaving. There was that moment when he kicked me out of the school, and as I was going through the door, with my back to him, he said, you'll never make anything of your life, Daltrey. And that was it. If he hadn't have said that, maybe I wouldn't have made anything of my life. This here is the house we moved to when I was 11 years old. This is the house where I made my first guitar. Um, and that room up there was my mother's bedroom. That's where the Who started. Born in a working class neighborhood in London, Daltrey met a couple of schoolmates, Pete Townsend and John Entwistle, who shared his love for Elvis, Bo Diddley, and the Everly Brothers. And we'd make a hell of a racket, and the neighbors never complained, because they were so happy that I gave up, gave up the bugle and started the band. They would refine that racket, add drummer Keith Moon, and build a sound around Townsend's hard-driving chords that spoke to teenagers' rage, angst, and isolation. Different than what the Beatles were doing, different yeah, than what the Stones this was, were doing. Yeah, this was in-your-face stuff. Stuff that came from the inside of youth of the day. While the chemistry clicked, and they'd go on to sell 100 million records, it was a combustible mix. You know, it was a very volatile group of people. Pete's described as four people who should have never been in a band together. Yeah, we were more like a gang. <laughs> yeah, we were much more like a gang than a, than a group. The band's success was matched only by its excess, a threat that constantly shadowed the Who from the beginning. They, we went on our first European tour, and they started taking am amphetamines and all kinds of, you know, drugs. By the last show, I think we did about five shows, they were playing things so fast, I couldn't get the lyrics in. I, I thought, I'm going to put a stop to this, so I went straight into the dressing room after the show, raided Keith Moon's suitcase, and flushed it all down the toilet. But the drugs never really went away. Keith Moon fatally overdosed in 1978. I wish we could have saved him. And knowing what we know now about drug abuse and, and rehab and all that, we, we might have done better. A cocaine-fueled heart attack claimed bassist John Entwistle in 2002. That left just Daltrey and Townsend, who don't actually see much of each other these days. So after half a century, 
working so closely with this guy, it's never ring him up and go get a beer and talk about life? No, they don't have that kind of relationship. We never did. We did in the very early days. We used to, after gigs, we used to go fishing. We used to play golf. Is any part of that sad to you? Not really, because I had it with him once. Um, if, if he ever wanted to have it again, he would make an approach. But um, I don't want to play golf. I'd still go fishing. <laughs> still, the two remain linked by something other than their music. So where are we? Well, this is the first um, Teen Cancer America hospital ward that we, we managed to get at UCLA. For decades, um, Daltrey and Townsend have given their names, money, and time to building teen cancer units in hospitals across the UK. And now, America. Nice to meet you, How are you? How are you, young man? A lot of people don't realize that they get the rarest, most aggressive cancers. Daltrey feels passionately that medicine was treating teenagers the way music did before rock and roll, as either kids or adults, when actually, they're neither. We're trying to achieve like independence when we're our age and like getting locked up in a hospital isn't like a great way to go about doing it. So like it's nice to be given something like this. Call it a payback to the fans <laughs> who formed the foundation of the Who's success. Without the support of that age group, there would be no music business full stop. Time we got me off. At a time of life when many stars might be focused on their legacy, Roger Daltrey doesn't appear particularly concerned. I'm just curious, did you ever see Mr. Kibblewhite again? No. I don't know if he's still alive. He must have known Roger well, Daltrey. I, I, I know in the himself. book I said it as, you know, a, a, a kind of F.U. moment, but... Um, <laughs> When I, when I say it now, I'm really, I really am thanking him. I mean, and I really mean it. 